Welcome to Highbury Congregational Church on this Sunday, the 7th of February. It's a delight to welcome one of our own church members, the Reverend Richard Atkins, to lead us in our reflection on the Gospel reading today. We gather together in the presence of the name Yahweh. I am that I am, I will be what I will be. We gather together in the name of our one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God whose very nature and being is love, his love expressed to us in the giving of his Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would come and fill our lives, strengthen us for the week that is to come. We gather with Psalm 147. Hallelujah! Praise Yahweh! It is good to sing in honor of our God. Sweet is his praise. Yahweh, restorer of Jerusalem, he brought back Israel's exiles, healing their broken hearts and binding up their wounds. He decides the number of the stars and gives each of them a name. Our Lord is great, all-powerful, of infinite understanding. Yahweh, who lifts up the humble and humbles the wicked to the ground. Sing to Yahweh in gratitude. Play the lyre for our God, who covers the heavens with clouds, to provide the earth with rain, to produce fresh grass on the hillsides and the plants that are needed by humans, who gives their food to the cattle and to the young ravens when they cry. The strength of the war horse means nothing to him. It is not infantry that interests him. Yahweh is interested only in those who fear him, in those who rely on his love. Let's gather together in prayer. As we come to worship you, Christ our Lord, We delight in your love, in your self-giving. Jesus, meet with us here. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, draw us together as this local church family. And that is, we gather together over the distances and and yet one in you that our gathering would be a sign of the great gathering of your church in every part of the world. Lord, we come to you. We want to bless your name. We want to love you with the whole of our being. So inspire us, lift our hearts into your presence. Make us open to what you have to say to us today. We pray these things in your name and for your sake. Amen. And so now we're led by high spirit in worship as we sing together, Good, Good Father, and Blessed Be Your Name. Thank you. 
So having lifted our hearts in song, our voices in praise, we gather together in prayer. Let's pray. Everlasting God, creator of heaven and earth, your love causes our hearts to soar. You know the number of stars in the universe just as you know the number of hairs on our head. Mighty God, we love you. You call each star by name, just as you call each one of us by name. Hallelujah. Mighty God, we love you. You supply the earth with rain to make the grass grow and provide food for the animals and birds. Just as you provide all we need to sustain us. Hallelujah, mighty God, we love you. You care about the details, seeing every tiny part of the bigger picture just as you care about the tiniest detail in our lives, you know the person that you created each one of us to be. Hallelujah, mighty God, we love you, we praise you. And so in your presence, we come with humility. In awe of your holiness, we come to make our confession. Lord, our lives are pressed by busyness people, people everywhere. Yes, the crowds pressed in on you with their need, day in and day out. They were seeking you, Lord, hunting you out, following you, hungry for your presence, waiting for your attention. Yet not once did you complain. We're sorry, Lord, that the weight of life's demands cause us to stumble to lose our temper and at times to buckle under the pressure. Help us, Lord, to be more like you. We're sorry, Lord, for not getting our priorities right, not knowing when it's the right time to say no, not being able to discern the moment for saying yes. Help us to know as you did the importance of spending time with you, drawing refreshment from our Heavenly Father. Lord, we're sorry for allowing other people and things to take over and to squeeze out our time with you. Help us. Help us to draw daily on your refreshing strength in order to cope with whatever our day holds. Lord, hear us as we pray. Hear our heartfelt sorry. Have mercy on us, O Lord. 
Amen. And we know that the Son of God loves us, and because of his love, healing us and setting us free from sin's guilt and power, it is because of that love that we are set free. You are forgiven. You are made whole. So let's gather all of our prayers in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. A story in the Bible. It's actually a continuation of the story that we read we heard about last week when Jesus uh, met his friends, called his friends. They were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. And in this part of the story, Jesus goes with one of his friends called Simon, and I suspect the others were with them as well, uh, to Simon's house. Now, when they got to Simon's house, Simon's mother-in-law was sick. She was in bed, not at all well. When Jesus heard this, he went to her and he healed her. I can imagine that he perhaps sat beside her. I can imagine that perhaps he held her hand, that he said a prayer. Um, and she was, was healed. She was made better. Well, you can imagine Simon and his wife were absolutely delighted that their relative was made better. And so much so that everybody else in their town, which was called Capernaum, wanted Jesus to heal their friends and relatives who weren't at all well. And Jesus was kept really, really busy. So I want us to think about today what we can do to show our friends and relatives that we would like them to get better. And I thought we could make some cards. So I've got some things together to, to start making some cards with. <laughs> First of all, I've got paper, or you could use card. Whichever you've got to hand, and this is what you'll have to do. Have a look in the house, see what you've got. And I had some bits of ribbon, because I thought that would make a pretty card. And I've cut out some pictures from a magazine. What else have I got? Oh, I've got um, a box of colouring pencils, felt tips and things, and another box of sticky shapes. Oh, and I definitely will need scissors. So let's see how we get on with this. Because this is only paper, it's not going to stand up like a card like that. So we need to fold it. So you just fold it in half like that with a crease along there. And then turning it the other way, you fold it again like that. And then that will stand up like a card. So that's one that I haven't decorated yet, but I have made a start on some others. Oh, the other thing I didn't get out was the glue, but I've got the glue there. This one you can see I've made with blue paper and some of my ribbon. Don't know if you can read it from there, but it says, get well soon. And this is the sort of card you could send somebody who wasn't well. Or if you're walking past their door, you could pop it in. Um, this is a card that I've just folded. I haven't started it yet, but I've cut out a picture of a very pretty bird. It's called a kingfisher. And I particularly like this picture because when I go for my walk in the park, most days, I see lots of people with their cameras and their binoculars looking for the kingfishers that live by the lake in the park. So I thought on this one I could write a message. What shall I write? How about hope you'll feel better soon. Oh, 
squash that a bit, but nobody will mind. Um, the other thing you could stick on a card is perhaps a photograph of yourself, particularly if you're going to send it to a grandparent or a friend who doesn't live here that you'd like to um, tell them that you're thinking about them. I like the colour of this paper. So this is very thin paper, so I folded it quite carefully. But can you see, I've cut out a flower from my magazine. And it's a flower that we've seen a lot of at the moment. It's called a snowdrop. And I particularly like that one, so I'm going to put that one there. Oh, that says, sending love. And I don't know if you can see them, but I've got some little green sticky hearts on there, because that's a symbol of love, isn't it? And this is some other sticky things that I've got. Look, lots of smiley faces. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm out and about and have to wear a mask, I can't show somebody that I'm smiling, but I could give them this card. On here, I'm going to write some happy faces from me to you. Do you think somebody would be pleased to get a card like that? Again, there's space inside for you to write a little message. So even though we can't go and visit people and go into their houses at the moment, we can show them that we're still thinking about them and still caring about them by writing a message in a card, and particularly a homemade card, they will love that. The other thing that happened in this story is that, actually it was the next morning, and Simon went to look for his friend Jesus, and he didn't know where he'd gone. Where's he gone? Anyway, he hunted around and eventually found Jesus in a very quiet place, praying. That's something else we can do at the moment, even though we can't visit our friends and relatives and go into their houses, we can pray, we can talk to God, we can listen to him and um, tell our friends that we're also praying for them. So I thought we'd just finish with a little prayer. And when you do a prayer like this, you might like to think about, can I go somewhere quietly like Jesus did? Because I don't know about you, but sometimes when houses are full with parents and children and families and busyness, it's not so easy. You need to find a quiet place. So let's just pray. I'll say the words and you listen. Jesus, this was an ordinary day in which extraordinary things happened. A day when you set out what really mattered. At Simon's house, you healed his mother-in-law. You spent time eating and sharing with your friends. Later, you showed compassion for the sick as you healed them. In the morning, you spent time on your own in prayer. Then you moved on to other places to tell them the good news. Jesus, as we look at this day, help us to see what your priorities were. To heal. To spend time with others. To pray. And to share the good news. Amen. If you were able to join in with our coffee time after the service today, you might have had time to make a card and you could show us on the Zoom when we meet later. But even if I don't see you then, it would be really nice to hear about a card and you can perhaps send a photograph to Andrew because then she could share it around us. Have fun and remember, caring for others can be done in all sorts of different ways, just as Jesus did. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. That evening, at sunset, they brought, hit, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. 
and Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighbouring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. It was one of those great musical moments of my life. That weekday lunchtime when I turned on our new radiogram and carefully put on the record that everyone was playing that summer of 1967. It wasn't mine, of course. My parents weren't great fans of pop music. My father believing that they should all get their hair cut and have a wash. But for this one lunchtime, I was able to play this LP, which I'd borrowed. There was only a couple of copies in the class and I had to take it back in the afternoon. So I carefully took it out of the sleeve and for the first time, the Beatles' mysterious epic, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, began to play on our home radiogram. Now, despite all the tut-tutting from my parents that was going on, I still played it, and it was that last track, that magnificent last epic track, that just made it wonderful for me. A Day in the Life is two songs brilliantly edited together on what now seems to be primitive equipment, creating a masterpiece five minutes, 35 seconds long. And it was that crossover moment of classical and rock. There was no turning back after this. And a day in the life, well, it still moves me now, even 50 years later. And if that song was one day in the life of two people, then our gospel reading is about a day in the life of Jesus. How our days have changed over the past 12 months. This time in 2020, I was going to work, driving here and there and everywhere to interview people, get back, edit the stories, then a meeting and another meeting with real people, then home to make tea and write a sermon. And that was a day in my life. And in the past year, things have changed for all of us. The day in our life is totally different now from February 2020. Now for me, it's work, walks, walk, work, sort out my Sainsbury's online order, work, walk, sleep. And it'll change again in weeks or months to something else, perhaps something better, let's hope so. According to this passage in the first chapter of Mark, Jesus had a very full diary for that day. He was here, there and everywhere. It's something of a whirlwind and this passage is only part of a much longer story which we don't hear this week. And it begins in a public space of the synagogue where he preaches, teaches and heals, challenging traditional understanding of the Sabbath laws as he does so. Then suddenly the scene shifts to the private space where Peter's mother-in-law is lying ill. And Jesus is as much at home here in a one-to-one pastoral situation or ministry as he was with the crowds and he heals her. And after sunset, when the Sabbath's over, Jesus is in the midst of the heaving crowd, all eager to receive healing from him and power flows from him to change these people's lives. Gosh, my goodness, phew! That's some day, even in first century Palestine. Then our reading presents another contrast, which I'll come to in a minute. I love Mark's gospel. Whenever I moved churches and circuits, I always began with a Tuesday evening fellowship meeting, and we took a look and had conversations about this gospel. It's so full of clarity. It's so full of colour. Read chapter four about the storm on the sea, and in the boat we're told that Jesus is laying on a cushion. The reactions in that story from the disciples are truly human. They could be you and me. Later in the gospel, we're told that the people sat down on green grass. Of course it's green. Why wouldn't it be? Or perhaps it's unusual to be green. Is that the reason we're being told? But it was green grass. Wow. Just delightful moments 
that move this extraordinary tale along. And the editors of this gospel, some 30 years after the resurrection, were very clever men and women. They would have made very good modern journalists. They take all the fragments of the stories they've heard and been told about Jesus and create something that speaks to the hearts and minds of the men and women who would read it. It's pure genius. And they tease us every step of the way, so much so that we want to read on more and more and more. Make no mistake, this gospel is a real page turner. But it comes back to the same question time and again. Who then is this? Who then is this? Who then is this? It asks us, the readers, to reflect on that same question. Well, we left Jesus at the end of that incredibly busy day, but we want to know what happens next. Of course we do, and we will. And the gospel presents us with another contrast. For when the next dawn comes, he is completely by himself, says, says Mark's gospel, alone in prayer. There is in Jesus' ministry that need, that desire may be to be almost submerged by the needs of people, but also to find time to be at peace, to be alone. The disciples never seem to be able to grasp this rhythm of life, which makes up the process of proclaiming the gospel, the message. Like those intimates of Jesus, our ideas of proclamation are often tied to the spoken word in the public forum, like this, like me preaching or any preacher. Yet Jesus' invitation to the disciples suggests that proclamation has a much broader content. His whole way of life is focused on revealing God's love through a holistic pattern of word, healing, and his walk with God. This takes him from public to private spaces and back again. It's seen both in his addresses to crowds and in personal conversations with people. It's underpinned by his own relationship with God and the time he makes for this. Well, you've heard about the crowd. We've reflected on the peace and quiet. So we come now to that third strand, the proclamation characterized by healing. In the 21st century, with our focus on physical cure, we often find it very difficult to grasp what healing meant in the first century. And the word translated as cure in verse 34, is there a pure? Which has obvious links to our own word, therapy. And in New Testament times meant not only cure, but serve and heal much broader than the words we use. And Jesus's power to heal is, in the broadest sense, therapeutic. He enables people to find renewed ways of living through proclaiming the message in the way that he himself lives. And there is a lesson here for us. For if we're to grow as Christians, we need to learn from the way that Jesus exercises his own ministry. We can, at times, lose our focus on what the church really is about. Why are we here? And what is the role of the church in this heartbreaking world? Our ministry in the life of the church and of the world, our actions as Christians seeking to bring about justice and peace, hope and healing is absolutely fundamental to the challenge of the gospel. But also fundamental are those times when we need to seek peace and quiet, to be alone with God, to seek her grace and forgiveness, to listen, to hear what we're really being called to, and not necessarily what we want to do. In the noise and conflicting sounds of the world, particularly at this time with all the pain of the pandemic, it's difficult to find a sense of peace and well-being. But that's what we're called to do. Search for that sense of peace and well-being as the editors of the gospel emphasize. For when the next dawn comes, so Mark's gospel tells us, he is completely by himself, alone in prayer. Who then is this? The disciples and people asked. Who then is this? 
we ask in our own lives. We may well discover that when we begin to balance our ministry, our concerns and work for the world and a personal peace in spirit, heart and mind, that Jesus calls us to be. Amen. God of love, you give power to the faint and strength to the powerless. Many of us are weary, juggling with school at the kitchen table, responding to demands of work or family life, or dealing with isolation, joblessness and fear. Scientists and clinicians are exhausted, trying to protect, care and treat through the pandemic. We pray for Highbury, encourage and strengthen us in our work, give us all fresh vision for the future of church. Turn us towards each other in acts of loving service, then turn us outwards to carry your gospel of healing into the world. Renew our strength and bind up our wounds, help us to hope in you. God of love, you call worlds into being. You number the stars and call us all by name. You created a world of plenty and beauty, of magnificence and diversity. We pray for faithful climate leadership here and across the world. We ask for bold and brave decision making that recognises the crisis we are in. God of all creation, you restore the face of the earth. Stir us up to action to protect our planet. May our feet tread lightly on the earth and our actions and priorities bring healing to our battered world. Renew our strength and bind up our wounds. Help us to hope in you. God of love, you defend the voiceless. We pray for the UK where society is marred by vast inequalities of life chances, opportunities and money, and where Covid has revealed the vast wealth owned by some and the struggles of others just to make ends meet. Today we pray for people living in flats covered in unsafe cladding who are afraid to sleep at night. Help us to be alert to the pain of others. May we hear the cries of the powerless, and by our words, choices and actions, may we be agents of healing in the world. Renew our strength and bind up our wounds. Help us to hope in you. God of love, we pray for the renewal of our communities. We ask that priorities would work for people rather than speculative investment, for the common good rather than corporations. We pray for the social cohesion of our neighbourhoods and are aware of lost networks of support and care. We pray for charities struggling because of the pandemic and as we look to the future, may we work to build connection rather than separation and restore the fabric of community. Renew our strength and bind up our wounds. Help us to hope in you. God of love, you heal the brokenhearted and you gather in all who are lost. We pray for all who are mourning the death of family members or friends. We offer to you all who are suffering in mind or body, asking for peace and for your healing presence in their need. Send your blessing on all who are afraid or alone or hungry on those whose lives are being destroyed by abuse or violence, and on all for whom home is not a safe place. Renew our strength and bind up our wounds. Help us to hope in you. God of love, your kindness is everlasting. Surround us with your arms of love. 
Keep our eyes fixed on you and make us ready to follow where you lead, trusting that you will provide for us today and always. Amen. Now we go with God's blessing from 1 Thessalonians, the concluding words of uh, that little letter. May the God of peace make you perfect and holy, and may you all be kept safe and blameless in spirit, soul, and body for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has called you, and he will not fail you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.